get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of inspiredinsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, um, you know, I have Dr. Hobie. I'm going to introduce you in a second. But, you know, Dr. Hobie is one of the reasons I started this podcast. He doesn't even know it. It's really to capture some of the most inspiring stories, what I consider some of the most inspiring people that I learn about or know. You know, I had a past guest, which is uh, Chris Ategeka. And Chris Ategeka, most people have never heard of him, but he started two for-profits, two non-profits. And he, you know, at age seven, he became an orphan because both his parents died of AIDS and he was the oldest of five children. And one, he was taking his brother to the hospital, Dr. Hobie, and his brother died. And he started a non-profit to create old bikes and he created them in like ambulatory bikes. So, because in his village, um, you, you know, it's a long way to the hospital. And so he actually created that. And he wore his first pair of shoes at age 17. He actually ended up, he speaks nine languages. He ended up coming to the US and getting his PhD. It was just an amazing, amazing story. I'm not even doing it. I'm not even doing it justice, to be honest with you. So check out that and other episodes on inspiredinsider.com. Before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 which I co-founded with my business partner, Jen Corcoran. And what we do is we help businesses connect to their dream relationships, partnerships, clients, you name it. Um, And we help you do that by running your podcast. And, you know, Dr. Hobie, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking for ways to give to my best relationships. And podcasting is a way to do that. And um, it really was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were concentrate in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only members of their family to survive. Why am I telling you this? Because he was interviewed by the Holocaust Foundation, and his legacy lives on because of a podcast, um, or not because of a podcast, because of an interview. And you know, I put that on my about page of my podcast uh, website. My kids can watch it. My when I have hopefully God willing grandkids can watch it, and and anyone can watch it. And his legacy lives on because of that interview. And that's what I consider when I have my guests on. So it's not just relationships, it's not just business, but is actually, I believe it's helping people leave a legacy um, beyond themselves. So I am excited to introduce today's guest and a shout out to Justin Breen. I would not know today's guest without Justin Breen. Justin Breen, thank you. His book, Epic Business, you need thank to check you, it out. Um, yeah, BR Epic Communications. The foreword was from Chris Voss, one of my favorite authors, I've also had him on the podcast of Never Split the Difference. If you haven't listened to that book or read it, it is a must, must listen to. Um, Dr. Hobie Wedler has been completely blind since birth. He is a scientist. He's a food and beverage expert and a passionate explorer of anything sensory. And you need to watch his TEDx talk. It was phenomenal. I didn't know he was a comedian also. But he earned his PhD from UC Davis in organic chemistry. Um, He founded Accessible Science, which is a nonprofit organization which held annual chemistry camps for blind or visually impaired students throughout North America. And he began opening doors to the world of wine aromas by holding truly blind wine tastings in Francis Ford Coppola's wineries. And he's conducted these all over the globe. And Dr. Hobie co-founded SensePoint, which is a sister brand called Tucker Branding. And they're a design company with a distinct focus and you guessed it, on telling stories to create memorable experience using all five senses with wine spirits, beer, food and beverage, and many others. And most people maybe don't know about this, uh, Dr. Hobie, but he was recognized by President Barack Obama in 2012 when he was named a champion of change. And Dr. Hobie, thanks for joining me. Dr. Jeremy, this is uh, such an honor. I love this uh, this podcast you put together. You know, it's it's just a such a phenomenal way to uh, way to way to share stories and way to create relationships. And I, I just love what you said about your grandfather and and having his legacy live on. I, I do have to ask, you must have heard some pretty amazing stories as a child growing up. Crazy stories, and that, that's what I love about your story. Is like when I think of his story and when I think of your story, I think. When we make excuses, that is just, it's terrible. Like, 
<laughs> you know, we have, we create excuses. We tell, we have self-talk, we tell self-talk of excuses. And when I think of his story, I'm like, what is my excuse? What he went through and what he started with, and he came to the United States with zero dollars and what he would not knowing the language and same thing with you, the things that you have to, that all of us take for granted. And then we, we have these excuses. I'm like, I mean, listen, I don't even know how you, you email me right away. You text me back right away. I'm like, I don't even know how you manage everything and do everything. Um, and so I want to talk about, I want to start the conversation with people telling you, you can't do things. Okay. Yeah. And some of those pieces, you know, those points along the journey where people told you you couldn't do something. Such an interesting question. Yeah. First of all, I really think that, um, the desire that, you know, that, that, that people have to make excuses just comes from a, a lack of belief in oneself. So I think that, that what we need to not make, ex- in order to not make excuses is we need to have extremely, we need to expect the world of ourselves because the minute that we drop those expectations or lower the bar is when those excuses start to come out. Oh, I, couldn't go to this meeting because I, yeah, got stuck in traffic. But if you had left 15 minutes earlier, you wouldn't have gotten stuck in traffic. You know, it's like, it's, it's all this stuff. Um, and, and I just think that if we, if we keep that, those expectations high and we're hard on ourselves when we mess up and we celebrate ourselves and we do well, you know, I think it makes it a lot harder to make those expectations or to, uh, to make those excuses. And one of the problems that I see in, in a lot of the, the world of, of other blind people I know is that, you know, sometimes society around them holds those expectations kind of low. And it's like, hey, if you got up out of bed and got dressed independently and made yourself a bowl of cereal, dude, that's pretty good. You know, a lot of people hear that. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but, but we're all human here. And we have to learn how to be the, how to be the best at whatever we do and, and just, you know, always be asking, what more can I do? And, and I, I give my parents so much credit for building those expectations up in me from a super young age. They never lowered the bar. I have a sighted brother who's two years older. And my, let me say, my parents, it was hard for them when they had a blind child and realized, oh my gosh, we're going to raise this blind kid. And we don't really know how to do that. But they learned, they figured it out. And then they kept that bar just as high as it was for my brother. And my brother mm-hmm. was a, a total trailblazer and madly successful so it's like he, he sort of paved the way for me to say oh my gosh this is this is what i need to follow and i'd, I'd be i'd be grateful if i could do half of what uh, of what he's done but it's all about keeping those expectations you know really high and believing in ourselves and i think what happens with nice high expectations if they're instilled in us is that we don't let other people's low expectations bring mm-hmm. us down with them so it's kind of the analogy that I would think of is like, you know, if you're, if you're holding up a hundred pound bar, you know, like on, on the ground, one end's on the ground, the other's in your hand, you're holding that up and someone comes in and tries to, tries to lower you down and, and, and sets a one pound pound of butter on top of the end that you're holding, you're not really going to feel it. You're going to keep that thing held right up high, right? Because, because your expectations are already up there. And if someone comes and tries to lower them, you know, from a very foundational point, and if somebody comes along and tries to lower them, it won't, you're not going to let it happen. You know, so I'm, I'm just saying that I'm, I'm grateful for every opportunity I've got, I've received in my life. And uh, I think it's all because my parents had those high expectations and told me very clearly, you know, this is your life. If you mess up, you should be blamed for it. Mm. And if you do well, you should get the credit for it. So you got to take responsibility for yourself. And that is what has led me to really be an educator. So I think that nobody, nobody um, really thinks that, uh, like, thinks that they know. And if they do, they're, they're wrong. I've had a few people in my life who, who think that they know what I can and can't do. Mm. A lot of times people will say something like, oh, you can't do that. You won't be able to do that. You know, and, and what comes along with that is this idea of, well, let me just show you how we can do that. So let me tell you a couple of, couple of fun stories, actually from my high school days when I was still up and, you know, growing up and my brain was still developing and this whole thing, it was all because of these high expectations that I was able to, to do what I did. So I've always, I've always had the heart of a teacher. I've always, ever since a young age, loved getting people excited 
or maybe something they didn't know they were excited about and just helping people see the world a little bit differently and just thinking through things. And, and it was a high school teacher, honestly, who got me so excited about organic chemistry and got me to ultimately pursue a PhD. And, and it's amazing what a, what a great high school teacher can do. But that high school teacher at the beginning of my chemistry career, so I'd had her class for physical science and she knew me and she was a very good teacher, but I, I think her attitude was kind of get through the physical science, just do, the, do what you have to do. I got an A in her class and I did well and she was super supportive. But when I came knocking on her door close to the beginning of my junior year saying, hey, I want to take honors chemistry. She's the honors chemistry instructor, a very good chemist herself. She says, I don't think that's going to work. You've taken physical science, you've taken biology, you've kind of done your science requirements, man. And I said, oh, yeah, but I want to take chemistry. You kind of inspired me to love chemistry, even in freshman physical science. <laughs> and she said, how's that going to work? You can't see what's going on in the lab. I said, hey, look, listen, let's work this out together. We're going to find someone who's taken the class before, who you trust, some senior who you trust, who's going to just be my eyes. I was able to work with with the, uh, you know, sort of registrar's office, counselor's office, whatever you want to call it, and found an awesome student. And she was my eyes throughout the lab experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing this instructor would do, she, she preached to the class, the whole class, uh, you know, when we would, when we'd be sitting there in lecture saying, let me tell you guys, chemistry is everything. It's why we breathe the air that we breathe. It's how our bodies process that air. It's the water you drink. It's everything and anything around you. So you all should make chemistry more of a part of your life and think about studying it and think about studying science in your career. And I actually walked up to her and, and I, I said, after one of these lectures, it was one-on-one, -on -one, I think it was during the lunch hour or something. I said, how do you think I should, because I, I love chemistry. And, and how do you think I should, and this is in the sort of beginning semester of the class. How do you think I should pursue chemistry? Because I want to, I just want some guidance as maybe how I should do this as a blind guy. And she said, you know, can, can I basically do what, you, what you've told the rest of the class to do? And she said, Hobie, I really don't think that's a good idea. I don't think it's practical for you because chemistry is so visual. You really need your eyes to do chemistry. And that was a, that was a hit, man. I was like, okay. So I found something that I really like. And now I'm being told by the person who's telling everybody else that they should totally pursue this. I'm being told not to pursue it. So mm. I got to figure this out. I got to figure out how to make her an ally and get her to, you know, make help, help her to understand that I can do this. And then she'll be on my side, able to figure out with me how to, how to, you know, pursue this degree. So I thought about it. I thought about it. I came to this conclusion. It was such a fun thing. It was a Tuesday morning. I still remember it. It was, a, I think the second week of the second semester. And I went into her classroom before school started. So early in the morning when she was just getting ready. And I said, you know, you told me that chemistry was a super cerebral science or, uh, you know, some uh, visual science that we, that we need to see to be able to do. Can anyone see atoms? I don't think anybody can see atoms. <laughs> so let's just think about that for a second. And she said, Oh, you have a really good point. And we, you know, I told her that chemistry is a cerebral science. It makes sense. When you think about how atoms and molecules and everything fit together, this is all happening in our mind. And all our eyesight is telling us is maybe what's happening in the lab, but it's not really telling us anything about the chemistry. We have to know chemistry to be able to interpret those data. And in fact, most chemical reactions, most things that we look at, we don't even use, you know, our eyes to see. So there's, there's a technique that I know you know, Dr. Jeremy, called nuclear magnetic resonance, where we use radio waves to probe things. And then we use a machine, which is an eyeball for radio waves to tell us what the heck the radio waves are saying. So the whole point is that chemistry is a cerebral science and she just totally turned and became an ally. I want a t-shirt that says you can't see atoms. Oh man, Dr. Obi, can, you need we to have can a do that. That'd be, that'd that'd all, be everyone in the science camp needs a t-shirt. They do. That says oh, man, you I, can't see atoms. If I, if I had known you when we had the whole, the whole science camp going, we're going to resurrect it. <laughs> And you're, you're going to be my marketing guy. There you I, go. Absolutely. Yeah, man. That, was, so, that was one point and someone told you you couldn't do something. I want to, I want to keep on that trajectory, but I want to go back actually to your yeah. parents and on the flip side, yeah. your parents had high expectations for you, pushed you. What was, where was a point where they pushed you and you got frustrated? Like, 
I can't do this. And they just pushed you. They were not going to accept that from you. You know, we would, um, so first of all, they're very understanding people and, and they, but they did, they did, you know, want us to do well. So it was all about them doing exactly what they wanted us to do. So they would, you know, my dad worked as a, as, as a manager of the basically power transmission system up and down the state of California and you had to be at work, you know, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, sometimes days, sometimes nights. And the other thing is we would always do all our own work on the house. So my brother and I became carpenters, plumbers, electricians, all that while growing up. And that was our parents' way of teaching us how to do stuff, which is just awesome. So it was not abnormal to get done with school work on homework. And as a blind person, you know, homework might, you know, schoolwork might take a little bit longer. And I really figured that out when I was in grad school, but um, you know, things, things take longer. So I might come home from school, spend four or five hours on homework a night and then go out and work on the house for, you know, three to four hours. And then spend all day, every day on weekends, either working on the house or doing homework. And sometimes it just got to be too much. It's like, guys, I gotta, I gotta be able to just, you know, get this work done. And, and I'm sorry, it take, I didn't say I'm sorry, but it, kind of takes me longer. And I, I should be able to have the opportunity to, to just, just get my work done. And then, and then relax, relax a little bit. <laughs> and they kind of said, no, dude, we're all working this hard. And, and my brother, I think had some of that for, for some of that feeling for himself too. And you just power through, man. And if you push yourself through just a lot of hard work, it, it, you get, you get good at hard work and then it doesn't feel like work anymore. And you just plow through and, and life is about hard work. And, and they set a good example. So it's not, this is what was so great about my parents and why it never really felt like they were pushing us super hard is because they, they worked just as hard. So they set the work ethic and we just matched it, you know, but that was, I often got frustrated when they would try to describe to me that I was, that I was blind and that, you know, I would do things, I would still be successful, but I'd have to do things differently. It's like, I kind of, you know, first few years of my life, I didn't really, until I think I was about 10, I didn't really know what it meant to happen to be blind. And then I kind of realized, and you know, those things were frustrating. And on the, on the flip side of that, they really helped me realize, Hey, you can, you can do pretty much anything anyone else can do. You just might do it a little bit differently. And, you know, blindness for me, man, this is important for me to say this right here in this public forum. Blindness is just a nuisance. It's just a lack of efficiency. So I think about the world totally in a sense of efficiency. And if we maximize efficiency, that's, you know, when we're, when we're doing the best work we can. And when you're blind in a sighted world, you just lack a little bit of efficiency in terms of looking at things and be able to, being able to easily identify them. But I really do believe that that's all it is. And, um, and, and that's, that's sort of the direction that my, that my parents took with it is, hey, we're going to, sometimes it just got frustrating. It's like, I do things differently, you know. I can't necessarily spend hours, you know, fi- figuring this out. You mop in the floor, for instance, because I, and, and my mom, who's a teacher of the visually impaired, actually, she took that job on as a special ed teacher after I was born, which is amazing because she brought all of the stuff she used at work into the, into the house. And mm you know, all the philosophies and all that. And she's like, yeah, you can clean the floor. It's going to take you a little while. And I'm going to teach you a technique. There's no reason there's no excuses for not being able to clean the floor. It's mm-hmm. like, that's, that, that was tough to hear when you were eight years old, but man, it's true. And now I'm, I'm so much better for it. Here's, I, I, I got to give you one more, one more example of someone telling me I couldn't do something. I want so, as many as you have, Dr. Hobie. So yeah. I'm an avid cook and I, I grew up in the kitchen. I grew up, I didn't realize I was doing this, but really honing in on my palate and learning how to, how to cook and how to use knives and, you know, to, to chop things. And, 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 you know, that was sort of my, my space. And my parents actually hired me to make large, large pots of soup for the family every, every few weeks. And they would take these soups to work. And that was, that was my job starting when I was like nine years old. So mm. I always loved cooking. And I had a passion for uh, science and for, you know, life science and animals uh, when I was in high school. And uh, we, we, at the Petaluma High School campus had the only student operated museum in the country. It was a wildlife and natural history museum. Still exists, it's a great place. And as part of that, part of that museum was, was treating, you know, caring for live animals. And the instructor who was there for all four years when I was there and shortly after I graduated got totally busted for embezzling a lot of money. Um, she, 
was she didn't like having me in class. I was sort of a, a burden to her. She wouldn't like to think about ways for me to do stuff. She would tell me, you know, she'd talk to students like me, but not me about, oh, you should get a career as a ranger, you know, law enforcement's great. And I always loved that stuff. And I, I thought about it a lot. And I went to her one day and I said, you know, do you think some of these careers are possible? And she said, no, no, that risk is too high. I'm sorry. That's, that's, that conversation does not apply to you. Shit, really? Okay. And then it, it got worse. I got into the museum. This is where it gets, gets really funny. I got into the museum class. That was in wildlife management, which is just a classroom class. Then I got into the actual museum program as a docent. Now I was a, I was a tour guide. People liked my tours and they would request me. So that was a, a big part of what I did is, is lead tours through the museum. But I believe in learning how to do animal husbandry and I wanted to feed animals, man. I wanted to prepare food. So I would, like other students, would use the knives in the, in the workroom to, to chop, you know, they're super dull, really annoying knives, to chop food for, for reptiles because they need produce, fruit, vegetables, what did you not, them? smaller chunks, right? Yeah. And then she saw me using, using the museum knives and said, you can't be in here. I said, what? She said, yeah, no, you're, you're not allowed to use our knives. I said, oh, oh okay. Why is that? Well, you can't see what you're doing, you know? And I said, yeah, but I'm, I'm a student, just like all these other students. Don't I have the same, don't I fall under your insurance policy the same way? She said, no, no, this isn't, this isn't good. And I, I took this to the high school counselor and they said, I don't know if that's right, that she can, that she can do that. And we finally came to an agreement with her that I could bring my own knives and that would allow me to, allow me to cut food. So I mean, and none of the other students could use my knives. They were Hobie's knives, Dr. Hobie's knives, whatever you want to call it. So I made sure to bring in the sharpest, baddest knives I could I could find in my kitchen. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna show her. I'm gonna bring the best you knives. Like a like, you can't use yeah. that dull one. <laughs> Everyone's Don't like, we want, we, want use, everyone. <laughs> we want to use Hobie's knives. We want to use our teacher's like, why why does everyone want to use your knives? And then they realized that, yeah, he brought in the he brought in the the, the, the knives that actually cut, you know. So it's just taking that that example of people saying no, you can't, and sort of turning it around into into an educational possibility. Um, I, I had one instructor, my first ever chemistry class at UC Davis, and this is the only instructor who's ever told me this, said, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be studying chemistry as a blind person. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And I don't know, you know, whenever I would ask a question, it was just like the most annoying thing to this guy. It's just so irritating. So I, and, and he even told me who, you know, why, why is a blind person taking chemistry? When I had him sign my accommodations document, this is my, like my freshman year at, at UC Davis. Like, and, welcome to freshman year. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, I decided I wanted to major in chemistry. I'm going to take this as a challenge and do everything I can to thrive and succeed. And of course I did. And, and I had no other instructors like that at all. But that was someone telling me, no, I don't think you should do this. I don't think you can do this. And saying, okay, I got I to gotta show you that I can. So there's a little bit of, to be honest, there's a little bit of competitive nature there. It's like, oh, you think not? Okay, we'll figure this out, you know. But it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's the challenge is what it's all about. And that's, that's what I think is so important in, in our lives that we live is to just challenge ourselves. And, you know, the motto that, that works for me is, is always challenge yourself to do something that you either dread doing or think you can't do and just take it in baby steps and you'll, you'll get there. Dr. Hobie, you know, one thing uh, it makes me think about is some of the work you did with Francis Ford Coppola's wineries. Uh, how did that come about? That was fantastic. So a, there was a, a man who was new to, to being totally blind. He actually had a benign brain tumor, really good friend of mine. He was just uh, he's a blind architect, actually, he's a man by the name of Chris Downey. Uh, so Chris lost his sight in 2008, and he was a super successful architect, um, sighted architect, and actually did a bunch of work for Francis Ford Coppola. Now, Chris knew that I was from Sonoma County, which is a, a big wine region, and I, I had sort of excite, excited myself on, on a, a good palate and on, uh, on being able to pull things out of wine that, that were unique, and he knew that I had kind of an enjoyment for wine. So in 2009, just a few months after he lost his eyesight, I was actually able to help him a little bit with, you know, traveling and navigation and this sort of thing. And, you know, he's a go-getter, so I'm not at all going to attribute any of his post-blindness success, you know, post-sight loss success to anything I did. But I, I think I like to think I was able to mentor him a little bit. And he, he definitely has, has served as a mentor for me since. 
But uh, yeah, so we, we actually hosted a, uh, we were both mentors at a program put on by the National Federation of the Blind, a science program in 2009, and that's how we met. Now, Chris, like I said, had done a bunch of work for Francis and before he'd lost his sight. And when Francis came to Chris, he knew Chris had lost his sight and came to him in 2011 and said, hey, you know, I really want to, I went to this kind of gimmicky program in Asia where, you know, sighted people led us through a blindfolded little exercise where we had to walk a few feet across a room and find a treat and unwrap it. That was just kind of gimmicky. But Francis said, I want to offer something like this at my wineries, but I don't want it led by anyone. It's got to be led by a blind person. I want this to be authentic. Mm. So can you know, do you know anyone? And Chris said, well, I know this guy that but absolutely, you know, that, that, that knows about wine, that's from the area that I'm sure would be, would be interested in this. So Chris kind of floated it by me and I said, yeah, it's something that would be interesting. Then I got a call from Francis's right-hand person saying, hey, do you want a position with us? Like, you, you know, co-innovating this tasting experience with Francis. And when, when that happens, when you get that phone call, you just say yes. And then you hang up and you say, oh my God, what did I just agree to do? <laughs> so that happened. And then, um, what was so much fun is that Francis really let me build the experience on my own. And it, it got a lot of exciting traction with, um, you know, with the press and then with the, with the trade team, with the sales team at Coppola, we actually spent, luckily for me, I, I studied computational chemistry as a graduate student with an extremely understanding and, uh, and kind advisor and really everything that uh, my, my laptop here in front of me is actually my laboratory as a computational chemist. So my advisor said, you, you do what you do, what you want to do. And I traveled the country with, with the Coppola team. And then eventually with a bunch of other, other brands, once this whole experience expanded while in graduate school. And that's, that's sort of how that, in, how that got innovated. And I still do a lot of blindfolded work, both uh, with wine and, and in a lot of other industries. I've actually even taught, high school students, how to sort of build empathy um, by working with each other, one under blindfold and one sighted, uh, both saw, you know, cutting wood with power tools and then uh, taking that wood and turning it on an electric lathe using, using some sighted assistance, but having 100% of the work be done by, by the person under blindfold. So the blindfold, what I'm getting at is when people aren't distracted by their eyesight, temporarily taking away that eyesight is an amazing way to, way to show that you know, what can happen when we, when we aren't distracted by it. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. Dr. We talk about some of the, the comments people would make as far as they go through the, um, the wine tasting, yeah, the blind and wine tasting. What were some of the things, the breakthroughs people had experiencing it like that? So funny. So I, I had one particular person who said, I do not like Chardonnay. Don't try to make me drink Chardonnay. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, you know, not everyone's going to like these four wines. These are totally harmless. If you don't like it, here's a spit cup. You know, it's no problem. This woman tasted the wine and said, whoa, this is, this is really nice. And yeah, this is cool. Yeah, she's got some green apple. It's got all these different things. You know, yeah, I, I love it. It's, it's a white wine, but, but I, I really like it. I said, yeah, did you know that was a Chardonnay? And her reaction was just, what? You served me Chardonnay and that what, what now I like it, you know? So people have these preconceived notions of what they like and don't like based on what they see. And what, maybe she had a bad Chardonnay 20 years ago or something. And she started drinking Chardonnay after that and, and really liked it. One of the things that I've heard too, is people say that when they, when they don't have their, their eyesight, they notice so much more about not only the smell and taste of wine, but about like the sounds of the room around them what's going on around them. They find themselves being more aware and more just sort of able to focus on what's happening. And I've found things in wine, flavors and aromas in wine, in, in wines oftentimes that they've known very well, but these, they've never noticed these, these certain flavors and aromas. So that's been, that's been really inspiring to me. And, and sometimes people say that's the most inspiring wine tasting I've ever been to because I've learned how to, how to think about wine differently. And, and I've learned a lot about myself. You know, when you hear comments like that, it's like that, that just makes you feel good. It's a, it's an exciting opportunity to, to open someone's mind up a little bit and, and show them that, Hey, your palate is good too. You know, Dr. B, you know, you have mentored um, people who are blind or visually impaired and like, for instance, Chris came and, you know, lost his eyesight. Um, 
what was some of the advice you gave him and um, on a, in a kind of practical front, what were some of the tools that he needed to now implement in his life? Maybe just start with what, what's some of the advice? Cause that's, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine what that's like, you know, yeah. having that something and then just having it taken away and then having to cope with that on an emotional level too. Oh, you and me both. I mean, that's, that's a really funny thing. And it's kind of ironic because so many people ask me, would you like to get your sight back? And I've never had eyesight. So my answer is no, that's going to be a whole new thing for me to learn. And like for you, if someone were to ask you, do you, you know, would you ever want to lose your sight? Of course not, because it's a whole new thing for you to learn. So I, I can't take any credit for, for Chris's amazing success. Chris laid in, you know, laid around, laid in bed for about, I don't know, two days in, in typical Chris style and said, tag with us. I got to get up and and get moving. And I just showed him some, some travel techniques that worked for me sort of early on in his journey and, and, and helped him just sort of by saying, Hey man, this is all possible. You know, by, by seeing another blind person out there just doing it, I think I hope was a, was a good, you know, thought provoking thing for him to say, yeah, I can do this. And Chris surrounded himself with really positive thinking, uh, progressive blind doers, you know? So, so one of the, the groups that I really want to talk about who I've, who I've done a lot of mentoring with is um, people who are, who are blind or visually impaired, who are, who are younger, who have been told they can't do science or they shouldn't study science because it's, it's too visual. You know, and my whole goal with Accessible Science, with a nonprofit that we founded back in 2012, was to show students that no matter how visual something might seem or people might tell you it is, you can plow through and you can get this done. So we would, we would have students do indicative hands-on organic chemistry for a whole day and use their sense of smell rather than their sense of eyesight to identify when reactions went to completion. And that was like, you know, we did things like ester formation from carboxylic acids and alcohols. And anyway, I won't get into the nerdy stuff. I'm sorry about that. Then we'd also have, have these students listen to talks given by professors who are, using chemistry every day for their work and who come tell these students, I, you know, you don't need to see to be a great scientist. And, you know, it's just that, that's the sort of, that's the sort of mentorship that I, I've really liked to offer, you know, and I, we've, we've mentored over 80 students through the nonprofit and, and it's just really exciting. I don't expect them to become chemists. If they of course did, that would be an honor, but just, just to sort of open their minds up a little bit more to the world and to show them that, anything's possible and you need to advocate for yourself and just get out there and, and do it and have some fun while you're doing it. This, this is sort of the, the part of, of mentorship that, that I've involved myself in um, sort of in, you know, as, as a, as a graduate student myself, trying to open those doors that were open for me for some of these students that might not have those sorts of role models in their, in their lives. Maybe it's their parents or their teachers. So there's some discouraging factor there. And it's, it's nice to break those, break those barriers down. A lot of the students that we mentored at chemistry camp had never worked on a stove, had never been allowed in the kitchen. Mm. We're talking about 17 year olds, Dr. Jeremy, people that totally should have been learning about how their food gets cooked. So I always included a, a, a cooking, uh, hour, you know, where students would learn how to cook their own burger, you know, and for some of these students, this is like groundbreaking to stand next to a hot griddle and, and do this, what, what you and I might consider a very simple cooking task. It's just like eye opening and groundbreaking. And the other, the other group that I am mentoring now, which is actually really fun. I'm on the board of directors as a vice president of a center that's, that's here in Northern California called the Earl Baum Center of the Blind. And we help it mostly adults who are losing their vision or who have suddenly lost their vision. And it's, it's amazing what, you know, the, the depression that people go through, but then by seeing and, and being around people who have sight loss, who say, Hey, it's not going to be that bad. Let's just teach you the, the things, several things you're going to need to think about and learn to, to get this done. You know, it's, it's amazing. Some of the things that, that we teach people how to do is, you know, it sounds, it sounds simple, but how to spread peanut butter on a piece of bread, you know, to make their own peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's hard when you've been able to see your whole life and now all of a sudden you can't. How to use a cane, a, a white cane to feel the ground in front of you rather than use your eyes to walk confidently. You know, it's all this stuff totally matters and is totally relevant to 
these people's, you know, need to live life. And one of the things that we see a lot of is that people's families, because they're, they're loving and they want to help, you know, end up helping too much. So a lot of our work is really saying, Hey, step back. You don't have to, you don't have to do this. And sometimes struggling through something and muddling through it and taking that challenge on rather than just, you know, letting someone struggle through something rather than just doing it for them ad hoc is such a better teaching technique. So that's, yeah. that's some of the teaching that, and, and mentoring that we've done. But I just think that. I think that goes across the board. I mean, yeah. even with kids, like, you know, enabling them when they're struggling. I mean, it's, it's, you know, grit. Yes. Right? It's what, you know, the, the book about grit, right? Totally. Wow. And then do you have kids at home, Dr. Jeremy? Yep. Totally. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. So you, you live it and breathe it. Yeah. And you know, um, the, I love that, that, um, you know, sometimes if I find myself, you know, stepping in, I have to think, well, you know, some of the biggest breakthroughs come from, you have to struggle and have that, that grit. And I remember the, um, Angela Duckworth's book, uh, grit, yeah. you know, um, and one of the things I wanted to, to talk about was, is sense point and you come with such a unique perspective and I hope you just walk us through, there is a, a project uh, with glass involving glass. I don't know if you want to yeah. talk about that. Yeah, no, I'd love to love to chat a little bit about that case study. So that was that was a lot of fun. And by the way, SensePoint and, and and our sister brand, Tucker Branding, are really becoming much more sort of branding and brand strategy companies. A lot of the work that I did in the early days of SensePoint, like the case study I'm about to about to tell you about, is um, is sort of work that I'm actually bringing under my own personal brand. I'm bringing under HobieWedler.com, you know, just because it's sort of it's sort of my my uh, stuff that I've innovated just as, as a person. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this, this glass project. So AGC is, is one of the largest glass companies in the world. Um, make a lot of glass for the, for the automobile, automotive industry, a lot of glass for the building and construction industry, and a lot of glass for the tech industry. So I'd say about 50% of the windows in your house and in your car were probably made by this huge Japanese glass company. So, a large tech company, one of the tech giants based in Cupertino here in the Bay Area in California, went to their glass supplier, AGC, and said, their industrial design team said, we need a glass that feels more silky. And this glass- I don't even said, know where to start with that, but, but go ahead. Yeah. So they're like, a glass that feels more silky? I don't know. We, we just sell glass. What do you mean? They said, no, no, no. We need a glass. We've been directed by our head of ID mm -hmm. to find a glass that is more silky. We want a, a different feel on our next release of smartphones and, and computers and their trackpads. And this glass company said, we don't know where to go with this. Is this silky glass? I don't know. So they contacted a group of insanely creative people. Yeah, that's a company called Ideal. I don't know if you heard of them. Yeah, Ideal, Ideal sure. Yeah. Yeah. So they're a you know, big global design company. They committed to creating, creating impact. And they're just like the, the kings and queens of design thinking. And I said, IDEO is going to be able to figure out how, what, what they mean by silky glass. And IDEO said, huh, that's interesting. Well, we don't necessarily know about silky glass, but we know some people. Oh, hey, we know this sensory guy, Hobie. Let's call him. And I said, oh, silky glass, right up my, right up my alley. Let's do this. <laughs> so we, we got to working on this project. And this is a collaboration that took a little over a month. And they just said, we need to figure out how to convey glass texture to our client. I said, oh, that's interesting. Let's, let's first define a metric for how we, how we describe glass texture. And using several different samples of glass with different coatings on it, we were able to identify a two-dimensional way of describing glass. So one axis on that two-dimensional plane goes from smooth to rough okay and the other goes from and rough i mean sort of tractive sort of granular hmm. the other goes from super sticky to super slick sticky meaning your finger kind of sticks sticks to it and doesn't move around very much slick meaning your finger just slides right across it and then rough meaning like i say granular and, and smooth meaning just a really smooth like 
polished surface. And by the way, you can have a smooth glass that's super slick, but your finger just slides across. Mm -hmm. So one axis is smooth to rough, and the other is slip, uh, sticky to, to, to slick. And we took four glass samples, and we decided that it would be awesome to have a tech day where we brought all the designers, not just the industrial design team, all the designers from this tech company through and showed them how we define glass texture. Glass is a little bit intangible. We don't go around feeling glass all the time. But we eat things, and we drink things, and we talk about the texture of those things on our palate. So the texture of a piece of cheese, if I said, hey, Dr. Jeremy, I'm going to give you a piece of cheese, describe the texture. You'd probably use words like soft or exactly. hard or ooh, kind of grainy or um, nice and smooth, creamy. You know, all these different ways that you might describe cheese, right? If I handed you a piece of fruit, you'd do the same thing. The texture of an apple would be described differently, very differently than the texture of a ripe peach. You know, it just would. So I said, we're going to help these people figure out what silky glass means by pairing four glass textures, which we overlaid on a, on a, on a touch, touch screen, with four different cheeses at one station, four different fruits at another, and then we're going to make everybody come back. So this is all throughout the day. We had hundreds of people come through, right? We said at the end of the day, everybody's got to come back because we're going to do a wine tasting, and we're going to pair each of these four glass textures with a different wine, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about how those wines feel on our palate and how that relates to how, how, what the mouthfeel is and how that totally relates to the texture of the glass under your fingertip. So through this exercise, by some industrial designer saying, ooh, I like the creamy cheese, or ooh, I like the, the grainy cheese, you know, whatever, we were able to come up with exactly the glass that they used in their, in their release, this is back in 2018, 2017, excuse me, in their release of their, of their next smartphones and trackpads. Amazing. It's kind of fun, and it's just outside the maybe a little bit out of the box thinking and it's kind of quirky and, and weird like I am. So, so that, was, I love that it. was a lot of fun. Thank you for describing that. And um, there's another um, interesting example in, in Barilla. Oh man. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Barilla is a, is a pasta company and they're a giant. They're now in over 150 countries and, and they're, they're doing a whole, a whole lot of pasta production, but also sauce production. And um, I'm getting they, hungry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Perilla. It's that good old Italian <laughs> cooking. You know, they um, they created a brand new line of sauces. So for the United States market, typically, historically, I should say, all of the sauces that they made for the U.S. market were made in the United States at their at their big plants in Iowa and New York. And we said, well, wait a minute, maybe we can. Maybe there's a, or they said, I shouldn't, I do not take any credit for this. They said, you know, we need a, we need a, a super premium sauce. And what are we going to do for that? We're going to, we're going to source ingredients from Italy. We're going to have the sauce made in Italy at our plant in Parma. And then we're going to sell this as a super premium sauce here in the United States. And the sauces, your listeners can go find them in most, most stores around them are called Vero Gusto, V-E-R-O Gusto, G-U-S-T-O. Now, I did a, uh, a, a blindfolded tasting event for their sales team and then for their sort of internal team uh, back in July where we paired the sauces with, um, you know, with a few, a few different ingredients and under blindfolds so people could get it, gain a better understanding of them. And they, they enjoyed that. And they had a whole PR plan for how they were going to sort of launch this. And it was, it was going to be a dinner where they invited a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, influencers and media, but it was just going to be a classic, type of Italian dinner where they say, hey, isn't this great? And then send them home with some sauce. They said, we got to make this a little bit more fun. So they called me, and this is a branding project that we did actually with, with SensePoint, very much with Sense, SensePoint. And what it really was is a product activation uh, along with a key experience. The experience part was me. The whole product activation part was totally SensePoint. We ended up working with a company called Edelman, who you've probably heard of. They're also a, um, you know, a, a fairly large creative agency, crisis management agency, this sort of thing. Um, and they are the PR partner uh, in this, we're the PR partner on this project for Barilla. So we worked with Edelman and we said, okay, but well, let me go back and tell you a little bit more about these sauces. So the tomato sauces, they're all tomato based. And um, 
they're, they're, all the ingredients are sauteed, so they're not just boiled in with the sauce. So they're, they really have some truly exquisite flavors in them. And the other thing to note here is that each, there are four sauces, and each sauce has a hero ingredient from some region of Italy. So the, they have a Calabrian pepper sauce with Calabrian chilies from the south of Italy, uh, basil, Genovese basil coming from Genoa, tomatoes uh, that are a really nice sweet tomato called the Dottorini coming from the area right near Parma in the Emilia Romagna region, and finally oregano that comes from Sicily, the island uh, just immediately to the south of, of Italy, um, and which is still part of Italy, of course, uh, but south of the mainland. So I said, listen, we need to put together, I was able to sell them, you know, put, put to them an idea of, um, we need to put together an experience that features each sauce next to its hero ingredient. And we need to do this, the whole tasting part under blindfold. But while people are under blindfold, we need to transform the room into having all the art fixtures that, that we might, you know, that might be reminiscent of this brand, have all the product branding all over, really create this super premium feel with a live bar. So a bar with live herbs and peppers and whatnot hanging from it. And we really went all out, painted the floors. And the fun thing is, Dr. Jeremy, we did all this while they were under blindfold. So mm. we blindfolded people in just a white, boring room. So, so let me go back a little bit here. I actually went to Italy and, with my business partner and collected all of the hero ingredients that we used in Italy from region mm. and did some really exciting things. So like in Calabria, where the, the capital of, you know, the Chile capital of Italy, we interviewed the president of the Academia de Peperoncino, which is the, literally the Chile Academy. <laughs> they have this. So we found him, did a whole day interview with him. Just got some amazing sound bites. We interviewed an a, a herb farmer, an oregano farmer in Sicily while walking through his, his fields. And we put together this immersive experience with actual ingredients, hero ingredients from Italy paired with each sauce that came along with sound bites from the trip to Italy with all these different people talking or sounds of the waves hitting the Sicilian shores. And just when everyone was under blindfold, we blindfolded them in a, in a white room and then brought them in and sat them down at tables that were preset with all this stuff. And over about an hour and 15 minutes, I literally transformed, took people to Italy it, with sound and smell and taste with all these hero ingredients and all the sauces. And all the while, while this was going on, the crew was transforming the room from what they saw, which was a bare, boring white room when they came in to this beautiful, you know, very representative, you know, landscape of, 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 the, of the sauce and it basically made them feel like they were in Italy. And, and really what we did is we, we blindfolded them in a room and then we walked them a, a, a few rooms over into the room where the, where the event was actually taking place. So we didn't have a bunch of noise of the room being transformed, but the, the sensation to the people when they took their blindfolds off and they saw all this amazing stuff, we turned up the music and it just became a great party. The sensation that they had was, oh my gosh, you guys transformed this while we were under blindfolds. So it created just a super impactful brand launch and a super impactful, exciting opportunity to really showcase you know something like a like a pasta oh like a like a sauce in general and and that sort of thing is is really when when i get to have fun and i get to sink my teeth in and just just really really have fun with something so that's what we did there i love it i'm it starving now but um <laughs> <laughs> um talk about you know it relates to what you're doing with flavor elevation yeah man so it's it's really interesting. I look at I look at a lot of a lot of people out there, especially during during the pandemic, who are now forced to to cook at home and who maybe don't don't love cooking, or, or people who love cooking and and just want a little extra. I my passion. I, I think maybe I said earlier, but I, I maybe I didn't. I have the heart of a teacher. My goal is to get people excited about things they didn't even know they were excited about. So I want to do this through flavor. I love food and drink and, and getting people to try things maybe they haven't tried before. And I love teaching. So I'm starting mostly an e-commerce, what I call flavor elevation company. And we're going to be, we're not launched yet, but as soon as we are, it'll be all over my social and, and anywhere you can, you can go to find me. We are going to basically start a rub and spice company. And I've got three products that we're starting with 
Um, one is a really super cool lemon pepper. It just lifts the flavor of vegetables you might be grilling or roasting. It's a great rub for fish and all these things. You want a rosemary salt, which <laughs> if you taste this That's rosemary That's my favorite, salt, by the way. You're going to be stunned when you taste this rosemary salt because it, it's salt. It adds so much crazy flavor. It's so simple. You can impress all well, your you friends. Well, you have a customer on me, for sure. Uh, I eat great. rosemary salt, that going to be no joke, on a daily basis, believe that it or not. so good to know. So good to know. And this one's got a little oregano in it. It's got a little sage in it, a little bit of lemon zest. You know, it's really, really fun. And then another that's just an essentials rub, which is a rub that, that I came up with a recipe of about a year and a half ago that's just, it really elevates the flavor of meat and vegetables like crazy, whether you're grilling or, you know, grilling grilling chicken grilling pork grilling tofu you know whatever it might be this this really lifts and enhances enhances flavor so my whole goal there is to just inspire people to to really build quality into their kitchen and and launch their flavors to the next level you know and just have fun with it so i have one i have two last questions dr Mm -hmm. helby first of all i just totally appreciate your time and your stories um and i want to point people towards your websites. Um, one is sensepointdesign.com. Where else should we point people towards? Let's point them to hobiewedler.com. Okay. There's going to be a lot of new stuff okay. there. Currently, that just redirects to SensePoint, but in about a okay. week's time, that won't be the case. And that's where I'm going to be doing all my cool. all my tasting work. Mm-hmm. All, you know, you can easily, that's where I'm going to be pushing the, the speaking work that I do. And I'm also starting a, a coaching program actually around awareness, really helping people to become more aware because I think sensory literacy, which is, which is what we talk about in my TEDx talk really leads to a, to an amazing sense of awareness. And I truly believe that awareness leads to full inclusivity and, and I'm doing some coaching on that and all that stuff's going to be coming out over the next month or two on HobieWedler.com. Okay. Everyone check out HobieWedler.com. That's H-O-B-Y-W-E-D-L-E-R.com. Check it out. Check out their past episodes out. Um, Dr. Hobie, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? And on the flip side, what's been a proud moment? So start off, what's been a low moment that you had to, to push through? It's a great question. And I need to, I need to think through this because there have been – there have been a few lows and a few, a few real highs. Um, for me personally, I think a, a low moment with, with running a business is just having to dig, dig down and figure out how to market that business. And, and not, you know, what I, I've done, I've done, I've started things that have, have not gone through to fruition. And when you put a lot of time and sometimes money into something that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily come to fruition. Well, it's, it's the entrepreneurial nature and it, um, you know, you got to fail fast. And sometimes those failures feel, feel low. Um, another low moment was when I was sort of in the thick of my, my graduate studies and just thinking, oh man, I have to get assistance reading papers. This is so hard. How am I going to get through this? You know, and almost, almost tempting myself to, to not go through with a PhD. And hmm. man, the high moment was getting that PhD and, and realizing that with the support of amazing mentors, like my graduate advisor, a guy named Dean Tantillo, who really saw a future for me before I kind of saw it for myself. Those are the highs. When you, when you break through something and you realize that you can, that you can actually do it, it just feels so good. Um, another, another low, to be honest with you, was thinking about, thinking about going to college and feeling that daunting feeling of, of, of living independently when I was finishing up high school, that was a really hard time. How am I going to do this? That's scary for anyone. It's scary for anyone. And, yeah. and I'll tell you what, what gave me the confidence to do that was when I learned in my junior year of high school, how to walk first from school to downtown to the local bus depot and wherever I needed to go downtown. And then when I learned how to walk from school back to my house, about almost two miles away from, from the school, I knew how to get from my house to school and school to downtown to the bus depot, I could get anywhere. And that's when I had that confidence, but it was still scary thinking about going away and, and making this work. But what's funny, Dr. Jeremy, is that when you do something and you push yourself into it and you, you just chip away at it, man, that low quickly becomes a high because you challenge yourself. And if you don't try, you'll never know what that success feels like, you know? So you got to try and the high moments are when you succeed and you just feel so good about what you've accomplished and, and accomplishing that first year of, of undergraduate studies and then just 
knowing that I'm, I'm free here. I can do this. And, and just pushing through all the way through to the end of grad school. That was a high. And now that we're, there's another really exciting high on the horizon, I think, which is, which is getting all our businesses sorted out and just moving forward and going forth. And I'm really in that challenge mode right now. I'm hunkering down going, you know, we're, we're going through some changes. We just are starting this sister brand to sense point. We're starting this flavor elevation company. I've got my personal brand that I'm just saying, you know what, let's do it. Let's get all this out there. This is a time of challenge. I'm not going to call it a low moment, but this is a time when I'm feeling like I need to learn how to market. I need to, I need to figure all this stuff out. I need to become better at this, that, and the other. But it's the, it's the time where I know that success is coming and I can just feel it and I can almost, can almost taste it, you know, and it's that, it's that feeling of really challenging yourself and then thinking really hard and working really hard and then, and then coming out the other side. So we're in, that, we're in that, that real challenge phase at the moment, but um, excited about the future. And I just want to encourage all of your listeners to never stop challenging yourselves. Don't make up excuses and never lower the bar on yourself or those who you mentor or those who you employ or whoever it may be in your life. Get everybody, including yourself, to take responsibility, love each other, be positive. This, you know, this world has no, no time for negativity. we got to just be our positive selves as much as we can be and no excuses. Just push on through. Dr. Hobie, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out HobieWeather.com and more episodes. Thanks again. Dr. Jeremy, thank you so much. It's a huge honor. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side.